For the second talk, I'm going to move on to one of these technical practices that I mentioned um, in there. Um, that of continuous delivery, it's one that has been one of the most interesting ones that I've seen develop over the last um, decade or so. When we wrote the Agile Manifesto back in 2001, continuous delivery is actually written in the first principle, which is part of why um, that name was picked for this practice. Um, we had this notion that we should be able to constantly deliver software rapidly. But it was something that's very hard to achieve. Had been achieved in some places. Kent Beck and his team was doing this in 1998 in Switzerland. Um, they had a very small team. They were working for this very rich insurance company, this Switzerland after all. Um, and they, had a, they were using small talk. So they were cheating by using the best technology ever anyway. Um, but uh, it was doable. But in most places, it is much, much harder. What do we really mean by this? What does continuous delivery look like? Well, we start with a programmer and an existing body of software. I never know how to visualize software, so I go for cogs wheels. What can I do? And the, the developer needs to make some kind of little change, um, some small change, that then has to be integrated in the software to produce the new version of the software. We all do this all the time. But then the question is, how good is that change? You know, you spend a few hours making a simple little change to an application, works on your machine, how happy are you that that's really done? And of course, in many organizations, that's done, right? The developer says, yeah, I'm done, works on my machine. You say, OK. Maybe, he hit you. Maybe the developer hit F5 to check things out. Maybe not. Who knows, right? The call to continuous delivery is saying, well, no, no, no this isn't done at all. We need to prove that this software really is working effectively. So at the heart of this is we, do, uh, we basically subject this change, this new piece of change software, to a series of more and more difficult tests. First tests are easy. You know, does the thing even compile? Does it actually build on a, you know, uh, a server, uh, a development server, rather than just somebody's workstation? And that's enough to fail a lot of cases, right? You've seen cases where that's not worked. But then we begin to throw in more and more tests, low-level unit tests, higher-level integration and functional tests, maybe performance tests that say, you know, has, has, it, has the developer done something that's actually going to slow the application down significantly and introduce a performance hotspot? A series of these things until we can be confident that this thing is good, that it's green. We call this series of, thing, of tests a deployment pipeline. It's usually, it can be just a single stage for small um, projects. For longer projects, it's a multi-step process. And it goes through environments that get closer and closer to a real production environment. Ideally, that last step has to be on as close a mirror of the production environment as you can get. So that you can be confident that if you flip the switch and put it into production, then everything's going to be good and your users are going to be happy with the new feature. Continuous delivery is about making sure that every little change a developer makes can go through this process, and you can confidently send it into production. At this point, it's, I need to make a distinction between two very similar words, continuous delivery and continuous deployment. Continuous deployment, you've probably heard a fair bit about companies such as Etsy or Facebook talk about this, about how every change a developer makes gets deployed to production, and it, these things happen every day. You know, you might see some little page. Um, I think Flickr was one of the first to do this, but to say, you know, we deployed 15 changes to production since this morning. You know, and, and this kind of, the bigger, a lot of these websites do this kind of stuff. Con continuous deployment is about taking all of those changes and just putting them through and putting them out into production. Continuous delivery is slightly broader in what it says is that we want to get to the point where we can do this, but we may choose not to. Because in the end, that decision about whether to take every little change and put it out to production is a business decision, not a technical decision. So it may be that the business people say, we don't want that degree of churn and change in the actual application. So we'll do it every two weeks. But the, the technical people are still able to deploy every change. So if they changed their mind and said, 
oh, I know deployment isn't until next week, but this is a really nice new feature. Can you put it in pro into production right now? All the development team has to say, yeah, fine, tap, 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 OK, it's live. You want that degree of confidence. And so in order to do continuous deployment, you have to be, at, you have to be doing continuous delivery because that's what gives you the confidence to actually do it. But the choice is still then become a business choice. And it may be other practical reasons as well. I mean, one organization that, does continue, that took on continuous delivery and were very happy with it was HP's LaserJet outfit. Um, and of course, they can't necessarily deploy all the time, right? Because they've got to update firmware on machines that you know, are not connected necessarily to anything. But they still went through that same kind of process. So how do you pull this off? How, I mean, I've talked vaguely about the pipeline. Um, what are some of the key things you need um, to get involved and do this? Well, at the start of it is automating everything that you can think of that can be automated. So obviously, the build has got to be completely automated. You've got to be, have a complete executable built from scratch in a completely automated way. Um, that's increasingly common now, but certainly 10 years ago, I remember hearing stories of, well, so there's a build person who gets you know, files from one developer and files from another developer and figures out, and it takes weeks. Um, now, it should be a single command. This also means deployment into any environment needs to be equally automated. So I can deploy it into a test environment. I can deploy it into a staging that's a mirror of production, deploy it into production. They're all automatic steps. And so hence, you see a lot of effort around deployment, automated deployment tools to sort this kind of stuff out. Also, it means that even provisioning new machines needs to be done in an automated way so that you can do this quickly. And of course, a lot of reliance on automated tests. I'm an extreme programming background. Extreme programmers are known for being really anal about automated tests. Um, and, and ThoughtWorks is, uh, has that habit as well. We are very, very heavy on tests. And that's because we need to be able to ensure that we're confident to deploy each piece. I should also say it doesn't necessarily mean that all tests should be automated. There is still an important role for exploratory manual testing. Um, but Automation is kind of the heart of what makes this thing tick. In order to be able to automate with this kind of effectively, you need solid configuration management. You always want to be able to know, I can get to any version of this software, and I can put it through the pipeline and pull it out. And I, any, that includes any past version of the software. So this means everything has to be kept in configuration management in well-known places, not just the source code, which is Fortunately, most people now put in proper configuration management, but also things like database schemas, deployment scripts, um, all the necessary stuff to configure servers. Absolutely everything has to go under version control. Because if something breaks in production, you may not know right away. It may be a process, something that's only done every couple of weeks. Then once something's broken, you've got to be able to quickly figure out what change caused the break. The DevOps term comes into play here. Um, I think of DevOps as a cultural phenomenon. It's really saying that application developers have to be aware of operational needs and take them into account when building the application. And it means that operations people have to think, how can we smooth um, rapid deployments? How can we make it be less of an event? And that it happens by the two groups collaborating. So there's a lot of collaboration between application development and the operations side. They're no longer seen as separate walls. Um, I mean, some places that have taken on this whole DevOps thinking have seemed to make things worse by introducing a DevOps team to sort of introduce extra boundaries and burdens between getting between um, developers and operations. Um, but the heart of it is this communication and cultural shift. And it's a cultural shift on both sides. Um, because traditionally, application people have not spent enough time con concerned about the operational consequences of what they do. And then the last major ingredient is continuous integration. Every developer integrates with everybody else's work frequently. Um, how many people here do continuous integration, just out of interest? Actually, keep your hands up. Um, does everybody on your team commit to the mainline trunk um, at least once a day. If so, you may keep your hand up. OK. Uh, do you have a solid battery of tests so that you're confident that you can find any bug before it went into production? If so, keep your hand up. 
And the last test is um, if you get a production, uh, if you get a production failure and, and you've, your, your pipeline breaks, do you fix it within 10, 20 minutes? Okay, those with our hands up can say they're doing continuous integration. And that's an important point, right? Everybody commits every day to mainline. You have the tests to make sure you're confident that everything's okay. And if they fail, it's, it, nobody has a more important job than fixing the, the breakage. That's the way Kent phrases it, very carefully. Um, that's what CI is about. And that's required to get continuous delivery going. Uh, that test of three questions, by the way, comes from Jez Humble. He does it every time he gives a talk like this. He says, and that's always what happens. Lots of people, their hands up at the beginning, hardly anybody by the end. So it's, it's not unusual. So why do we think continuous delivery is worth bothering with? What are the benefits of continuous delivery? I focus on three, and the first of these is lowering risk. If you've got a large body of work that needs to go into production, there's lots of potential things that can go wrong. You shrink that change down and make it very small, there's much less to go wrong. Also, should something go wrong, it's usually easier to identify and fix. I mean, the simplest fix is you roll back to the previous version. And you should always be ready to do that. Um, anytime something goes wrong, you're monitoring, you suddenly see, oh, the amount of new orders has dropped unusually, roll back. I mean, you should always be able to do that rapidly. Um, but the point is, with smaller things, it's easier to find a problem. Um, the example I gave, how about something that you don't know it's broken until two weeks later because it's only something that happens every two weeks? Well, if you've got configuration management and lots of little changes, you can fairly rapidly isolate where the problem is and say, oh, it was this particular change that occurred three days ago. That introduced a bug, and you've got much less code to look at. You can figure out how to fix it. So small changes lower risk. And it sounds counterintuitive because you think, well, if I'm making 10 production updates every day, isn't that going to make things more risky? Well, no, because they're a lot smaller. It's, it's one of the little um, adages of agile thinking is, if it hurts, do it more often. Because what you'll figure out is by making smaller changes, you're able to lower the pain. And that's the, one of the big surprises for people who do continuous integration. It sounds very scary to say everybody's committing to mainline every day and all this kind of thing. But when you do it, you begin to realize integration goes away as a problem. Because you, each piece is so small and you're doing it so frequently, it doesn't matter anymore. And that's, in fact, how continuous deployment works for a lot of organizations. They just don't think about deployment issues anymore because they're forced to practice on doing it frequently and they keep the changes small. So that's the first reason, lowering deployment risk. The second reason has to do with this notion of done. I mean, we've all seen project charts like this, right, where you've got a scope, target, this is the classic scrum burn-up chart, backlog all going well. So you look at a chart like that, you look at the predicted line, you're feeling good. But then, what does done mean? Is there a developer saying, hey, I'm done with this. Then how happy do you feel about that chart and what it's telling you? Not very, if you're me. However, how do you feel if they say, no, it's deployed live. Each of those steps is a live deployment. Then you feel a lot more confident. So the second reason for continuous delivery is that it gives you the sense of real progress. Even if you're not deploying live, but you're deploying into as much of a replica of a live environment, it's not perfect, but it's still a hell of a lot better than developers saying, yeah, I finished that piece of coding. So the second reason for continuous development is you know what progress you're making. The last reason is more a thing from continuous deployment, but you don't get so much from just the delivery thing if you're not deploying um, frequently enough. But we know that when we put stuff into production and we get actual users working with a system, we're going to get all sorts of interesting things that come out of it. Some users don't understand our beautiful UX changes and say, what the hell's going on? Some say, I didn't want that. You've taken away something important or whatever. We learn by putting stuff into production. We, don't, we can ask people till we're blue in the face, what would you like? But it's only when you actually give people something they will tell you what they don't want. We've known that. That's been an inevitable feature of software development. And the plan-driven folks sort of desperately tried to predict and not have this loop. 
But now we're learning to take advantage of a loop and say, let's get something, anything out there and then see what people do. Don't listen to what people say they want, but actually monitor the software, see what they're doing, and then use that to decide um, what we do next. And that you need continuous delivery to be able to pull off so that you can get that kind of learning loop into place by taking that user feedback and learning from it. Now, continuous delivery isn't an easy practice. It does take months to get it into place and to be able to do it well. But these three benefits give you a lot of feedback, uh, a lot of positive return on that investment. And that's something that I've seen. When I started with ThoughtWorks and ThoughtWorks began its agile stuff back in 2000, we started with continuous integration, but it took a long time to get to the point where we could do continuous delivery on projects because there's just so many steps in, in, in enterprises to be able to get from working in a lab to actually in a production like it environment. Um, but it's been one of the biggest benefits, I think, that we've seen. Um, we've learned a great deal from doing this. Um, and it, I very much recommend it. If you want more, the canonical thing for this is the book by Jess Humble and Dave Farley, um, which goes into a lot of detail about continuous delivery. There's a page on my uh, website as well where I at least outline some of the things that I've just talked about. Um, but this probably is one of the most critical um, practices, critical hearts of actually being able to really get that two-star fluency in agile thinking. So that's the second talk.